Okay, great. We've got the live stream set up. It's working. I tested it. Great. I realize the first shot of the live stream will be me like eating and drinking. <laughs> It's okay. It's always like our face on focus and I like skip it <laughs> every time I see yeah. it again. Or when I share the link, shit. I always make sure I always make sure to like um Cut up fast it. forward past <laughs> us. <laughs> Just like nobody needs to see that. Um I could actually crop it out, but it would take like extra effort. And turns out I'm lazy. So here we are. All right, we'll just um uh, get started in a couple of minutes. So. Nice. Your um, your opening slide is very uh, the Matrix, Ben. Been <laughs> misbehaving at the minute. Just one sec. <laughs> um. Looks great. Looks good. Yeah, if it if you want to just leave it up, that's fine because then um don't have to wrestle with Zoom. Yeah, if I disappear in between, it's my computer restarting probably. It wants to I'm trying to remove the update but sometimes it's forced on us and i can't do anything about it <laughs> what's well, so weird why would nih like uh, schedule updates for the middle of the work day no so okay they do it like usually on friday or something but then if i haven't opened my laptop over the weekend or something it just forces whenever mm. yeah and then it really forces it <laughs> <laughs> can't do much about it <laughs> right now okay well um hopefully uh, neither of us will disappear uh ben is also a co-host if that happens <laughs> it's kind of rainy and um i saw a, an electrical um truck driving around outside so i think some people might have lost power on my street and i was like great good timing um hopefully no technical problems will arise <laughs> All right, so I think we should uh, do you start. Want to go ahead? Yeah, yeah. Um, hello everyone for another uh, session of cell migration seminars. Uh, sadly, we're not going to have Dave today. Uh, he's unwell, but hopefully we can pull him for some other day. Um, but first, we are going to have uh, Professor Ben Gould today. Uh, ben is a biochemist and structural mechanobiologist, and since two thousand five, Ben has been working on protein tailing. So, well. That's a long time working on tailing and its role in coupling integrins to actin and uh, microtubule cytoskeletal at the core of integrin mediated cell adhesions. Um, so he did his PhD at University of Manchester and after a brief spell in industry, Ben moved back to academia in 2006 to do a postdoc with David Critchley to work on structure of tailing. Uh, since 2014, Ben has been in University of Kent to set up his own research lab looking at mechanobiology of tailing. Um, and uh, the main focus of his lab has been how the rod domains and tailing act as force dependent binary switches. And I think that's what he's going to talk about today. Thank you so much, Ben, for accepting our invitation today. We're really looking forward to your talk. Great, thank you, Ankita. Thank you, Jen, um, for the nice introduction. I know I helped write it myself, but it was still very nice. Um, and thank you, everyone, for listening and the opportunity um, to present to you all in this excellent um, seminar series. Today, I want to talk about our ongoing saga to try and understand this protein tailing and its function in all um, integrin adhesion complexes, essentially, almost all. And more recently, we've started to really develop this idea of Taylin's role in mechanical memory and how these binary switches, which Ankita introduced, um, provide a way to maybe store and um, capture information in the shape of these molecules. So that's what I want to talk about today to try and introduce this um, concept of spatial organization, which can be encoded by these binary switches. 
And I'll just say I've spent the afternoon trying to trim this down to 25 minutes. So the opportunity to go slightly beyond that is, is quite a relief. So uh, that's why I'm actually not talking quite as fast as normal. So this is the protein tailing. And in this audience, we don't need much of an introduction in what tailing does. And um, we're all probably all familiar with integrin adhesion complexes. Needless to say that the cells of our bodies have got integrin receptors on that. On, on their outside, which can physically grab onto the extracellular matrix. And in doing so, the cell can adhere or it can migrate or move. And just inside the cell, the protein tailing can pull on these short cytoplasmic tail of the integrins and coordinate the activation state of the integrin, holding it in a high affinity um, state. But what tailing also does is it couples it to the cytoskeleton, both to the actin and also indirectly to the microtubial cytoskeletons, serving as a, a, um, a connection between the integrin ECM complexes and the cytoskeleton. And the classical view of um, mechanosensing of these systems is that when tailin experiences um, forces, both from inter intracellularly or extracellularly, it can undergo these changes in its shape and recruit the protein called vinculin. And vinculin is an adapter which binds to tailin and couples it to the active cytoskeleton, reinforcing these linkages. But what's interesting is here I'm defining four proteins, an integrin, a tailin, and an actin with vinculin cross-linking it. But onto this simple um, core complex of these adhesion scaffolds, you can assemble many different diverse structures. And these are all mediated by this integrin tailin actin core from these very, um, dynamic adhesions in a migrating cell as shown in this fibroblast crawling along the surface in this beautiful video from Mark Morgan, to these more long-lived persistent junctions and um, adhesions in these myotendinous junctions connecting these muscle cells together. Tailing is also essential in podosomes and evadopodia and in the coupling of the cell division and the adhesion machinery as shown by this cell at the bottom undergoing mitosis letting go of 99% of its um, adhesions and then immediately re um, going, undergoing mitosis and then immediately respreading. And also what we're interested in is these synaptic adhesions, which um, are essential for these intimate cell-cell junctions, which enable signaling between adjacent cells. And tailing is essential for all of these processes. And as um, was and uh, Keith pointed out, I've been working on this since 2006 when I joined Dave Critchley's lab. I was actually working on, on tailing in 2005 because when I was at AstraZeneca, I, I was asked to um, test a load of NMR software and choose which one they were going to adopt. And at the time, the state of the art one was being, the scripts were being written for it by a guy called Igor Barsakov, who was um, worked with Dave and was my boss for a few years. And he sent me some scripts and he sent me tailing data, model data, um, to work on. And that went really nicely, leading to me to go down to Leicester and ultimately to work on this protein. And so for the last 10 years, we've known what this molecule looks like. It looks like this. And it literally is 10 years, because when I was looking, it, it was last week that we published this paper and, and defined that there's 13 switch domains in tailing. And these are now called R1 to R13. If you look at papers prior to this one, then the naming of the, um, the domains of tailing is a hot mess, but this clarified that. So now they'll just be referred to as R1 to R13. And in this simplest arrangement, the N-terminal head domain binds to integrins, the C-terminal um, regions bind to actin, and that positions all of these um, helical bundles in this force transmission pathway. And something which we noticed in um, 2013, which dictated the flow of my um, research ever since, was that tailing changes partners in response to force-induced conformational change. And that's the crux of what I want to talk about today. And it's illustrated quite nicely, I think, by this video showing a tailing molecule here, which our initial switch we discovered was this R3 domain which when it's in this closed compact form binds to this RAP1 effector called RIAM. But then when it force is exerted on this molecule, it, that, that domain unfolds and simultaneously exposes two vinculin binding sites. So you can see that happening here. We pull on this molecule, you cause this transition and you change this signaling. Something which I've not got time to talk about today, although it may be turned out I would have had time to talk about today, is that um, 
this stretching of the tail in is act can activate vinculin. It's shown in this video, but this actually happens. You stretch a tail in and you can relieve auto inhibition of vinculin. But what I was interested in when I was in Dave's lab and what I set up my lab to answer was how much force is required to unfold the R3 domain to cause this um, conversion of mechanical force into a biological signal. I just want to take a brief sidestep just to quickly acknowledge um, Sam Barnett because um, over the last year we've been working a lot to model these structures and to actually draw them and visualize them and he was um, central to making these beautiful videos which I'm going to show which I think are very instructive of what we're talking about. Um, but the, the question was how much force is required to open that R3 domain of tailing to cause that change in biological signaling. So I emailed Mike Sheets in Singapore and he put me in touch with a, a guy, a professor there called Yan Ji in the Mechanobiology Institute. And ever since that first email, we've become really good friends and we've really um, done some, I think what is cool, you see what you guys think, but to try and work out what's going on here. And the initial experiment which we did was to take three of these domains of tailing and attach them to the cover slip of a microscope, which then we via the end terminus and then via the C terminus, we could attach that to a magnetic bead, which then allows us to use a, a permanent magnet on a mag magnetic tweezer deck to pull on that bead and exert physiologically relevant forces onto these molecules. And when we do that, when we stretch these three domains of tailing, what you see is that as the force increases, do you see my cursor? Yeah, I do. You it's do? tiny, okay, but yeah. I don't see it. Um, as the forces on the molecule increases, this molecule gets pulled taut. But then what you see is these large jumps in extension. And there's three of these. These are these protein, these tailing rod domains unfolding independently. And I, I would have had time to show you, but the R3 domain has got this, um, is the initial mechanosensor, is this domain here. And we can show that's the case because we can make mutations in R3 which stabilize it and shift this initial folding step. So this defines all three of these domains as, um, as um, switches because they open and then they close when force goes away. This is six cycles of the same thing, stretching it to spaghetti and then letting go and it immediately resets itself. And then we wanted to expand this to look at the whole of these. Having found three switches, we wanted to see what the, all 13 of these look like and to look at the complete mechanical response of this molecule. And when we stretch the 13 domains of the tailing rod, we get this panel here. And this is still mind blowing to me because it's even though we've had it seven or eight years, um, that it looks, it's, it's this complicated, but also this um, re robust. And what you see when you start to increase force is you see R3 unfolding first. That is the mecha initial mechanosensitive responsive tailing. But then what you start to see is this step-like behavior as these domains reach their force threshold and unfold independently. So this sh um, shows that each rod domain is a mechanical binary switch, and each step corresponds to a single domain converting from a folded state to an unfolded state. And because we have ligands for most of these in the folded and unfolded states, each of these steps rec represents a domain mechanosensing and changing its biological signaling in response to force. Another hand up. Do we answer questions as yeah. we go? Or? Yeah, would you mind? Um, I think Claire has a question, if that's okay. Hello, I just Claire. wondered if those. Hi, hi, Ben. Great to nice great to see you. Um, I just wonder if those go in a similar a, a, a sp specific order that yes. unfolding. No, it's a good question, and um, sort of. So these ones in this um, R three always goes first. These ones about eight to ten, eight to twelve picnewtons. It'll always be one of those goes second. And these really stable ones are always really stable. So within the order which it unpacks, there's a bit of stochasticity to which one of those in this pulling end to end. But obviously when other things decorate this and different forces load on it, then they will, I think they'll be in a very specific order. Um, so they are in an order, but you couldn't tell which of those three would go next. It'd be one of those three that answers the question. So this leads to a, a framework we've been trying to develop to understand mechanotransduction and mechanical signaling through these integrin adhesion complexes. And this notion of tailing serving as a mechanosensitive signaling hub and where it can recruit different molecules depending on the status and the shape of that individual molecule. 
So here I'm showing a low force condition where all of these domains are folded and you recruit a certain subset of signals and there's a binary pattern of four folded domains. And the readout is this assembly of these molecules which decorate and then if there's a, a contractility event, a signal comes in, switches on the motor proteins, that can pull on this protein, and then the weakest domain in that order will unfold. It will displace the signals on the outside, but recruit things like vinculin, which reinforce these networks. And then a, a subsequent contraction will change that and update it again. And the readout will be these altering um, signaling um, complexes which form. And this led to, when I looked again, this is how quickly time flies. This I thought was last year, but it was actually Christmas of 2021. We started to put all this together into a, one of these, um, my favorite series of review articles and at a glance in Journal of Cell Science, where you try and conceptualize the whole idea into a poster. And this is a blatant sales plug, but if anyone would like a copy of these, we got sent loads of paper prints. I'd be happy to send them out and just drop me an email. But on this poster, we started to summarize all of the different ligands which we've got, which are interacting with this. And this is an abridged list because these are the ones which are published. Um, but what you can start to see is each of these domains is switching on and off different um, functions as a function of its um, shape. And because you've got this massive network of competitive interactions combined with the switching of 13 binary switches, this is really complicated. And it's even more complicated because there's lots of different ways that this molecule is getting pushed and pulled via its um, linkages to the site, to the actin cytoskeleton and to the microtubule cytoskeleton and the extracellular environment, the stiffness, whether the cell is migrating. But this is incredibly robust because development happens nearly perfectly. So these mechanical signals and these protein and chemical signals all integrate in, um, in a really re reproducible signaling way. So there must be... Um, it has to be metastable in response to all of these um, diverse multiple inputs. So what we want to understand is this coding, this mechanical coding at the protein level. And more recently, I've changed the naming of this ever so slightly because everything I've spoken about so far is on a single tailing molecule. And obviously, a single tailing molecule doesn't exist in isolation. It exists as part of a complex meshwork of molecules such as tailing, such as vinculin, which assemble at the, on these integrin complexes and make a meshwork of mechanical switches. It's why I, I called it a meshwork code. I thought it was more of a mesh code was a more of an app name to be more broad than just a pure tailing code. But then as a function of all of the inputs and when this cell reaches mechanical homeostasis, then there'll be a certain pattern of these switches which are then decorated with signaling molecules in a context dependent manner, depending which binding sites are accessible and available to give rise to very specific signaling complexes. And that's the idea we're trying to develop and trying to um, prove. And if you imagine a cell in culture, um, these adhesive structures, these um, cytoskeletal structures, they're very dynamic and they change over the tens of seconds because the cell tends to adopt a migratory phenotype. So when you imagine what's happening to those tailing switches, then you've essentially got a balance between a change, two changing um, forces. You've got the extracellular forces as this cell's migrating and moving, which are constantly changing. And then you've got the cell's internal cytoskeletal force generation machinery switching on its motor proteins. So the resulting switching pattern, which you end up with, is, is, the, is the sum of those to give, a, give rise to a quite a dynamic um, switch patterns. When I was coming back from, Singap um, from Australia in 2019, sat at the airport, I started to think about a question from Peter Gunning in, in, Bris um, in Sydney. And he asked about why, how all these tailings um, could be so, how it could be so robust. And something which occurred to me, and it's a very simple um, question, is what would happen if the extracellular environment is constant and predictable in this scenario? And by, what, by this, I don't mean it never changes because the cells invest a huge amount of resources into remodeling the extracellular matrix to make it completely um, re predictable. They know what it is because they've essentially built it with the help of fibroblasts and other players, obviously, but they know what that is. In this scenario, this, um, this equation gets much more straightforward because now the extracellular forces are, are, are not changing as much or they're known. So it's no longer a tug of war. Now what we could imagine is that you could have um, a series of switches which are being operated via the cell's force generation machinery. 
So the cell could sw- receive a signal, switch on contractility and pull on this and update this pattern and update the resultant signaling. And that was the general idea which led to this paper where I started to try and work about that if these systems are ordered and if these adhesions are more ordered than what we currently envisage, then they can be able to um, store information. You could write information physically into them because you could change the shape of these molecules using small changes in contractility. And in doing so, you could update the signaling of that cell, but in a quantized way written in, in a binary format. So that was an idea I had. I wrote an article on this. This was under review for, I don't know, nine months or something. It took ages. Um, but it really sharpened up. And in that paper, what I tried to argue after the first half was about the actual serious stuff. And then the second half was a bit more what this might mean if it was ordered. And one of the ideas that it led to was this notion that maybe you could have um, a binary coding on both the pre and the post synaptic side of this, which would alter the activity of that synapse, but also be information that is written in there. But the obvious question, which um, everyone asked and kept me up at night was how though, that all sounds nice and well, it sounds well, it depends what you think, you might not think it's nice, you might think it's horseshit, but I mean, it sounds like out there. And one of the things we started to do was we actually tried to build a simulation of tailing, receiving signals, updating. And we suddenly realized that was really hard. But one of the things we realized as we started to build the components to feed into that is that um, we, there's something which we had completely overlooked in terms of the dimension, dimensionality of these systems. And that's what, if you look at what happens if you draw these molecules to scale, this is a, a scale drawing of tailing with all 13 domains folded. And the, the rod's about 55 nanometers. If we just take two of these domains, and draw them out like this with two ligands bound to them. And then watch what happens when one of these switches opens up. It introduces um, 50 nanometers in length into this molecule. So in essence, a single domain opening is pretty much the same length as the entire tailing rod. So the rod's doubled in length with just a single domain opening. And if you look at the spatial organization of those molecules which are sat on it with these hypothetical orange and blue and pink shapes, then they've been relocated dramatically as a function of that single switch opening. So you've obviously, with the, the switch which is opened, you've got the change in binding partners, but perhaps more interesting is the cyan guy who is still bound to the same site he was before. He's just 55 nanometers further away from where he was before this unfolding event. And when you draw that, then what you can start to see is that this molecule is undergoing dramatic changes in its dimensions from a compact 86 nanometer um, long molecule, unpacking these domains and going in quantized 40 to 50 nanometer steps in its length. And it's 40 to 50 nanometer, nanometer relocating of these binding sites for these different proteins. So what we came to realize is that there's a a massive distortion in how we usually draw and think of these complexes. And these two drawings here are incredibly useful. They've shaped the field and they're really, and I'm saying, I'm not saying that because Claire's here, it's actually because it's true. Um, But this is like a framework where we can understand this, but it's only a snapshot of a tailing and it doesn't capture the, 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 the range which is seen in the supplementary figure of this. And I'm even more guilty here because I'm actually cha- showing the switches change shape, but no change in dimensions. So I led this to the uh, Mercator projection map of the Earth, where this is incredibly useful. This is a common story and a common um, idea which everyone can share and understand. But it's distorted in that, it, um, like in the Mercator projection map, where Greenland's the same size as Africa, which obviously it's not. And, but it means that you can use it, but you, you lose a key part of the information by, um, by reducing it to this single image, which everyone holds. If we re-envisage that and think about this drawn to scale, so here's those scale drawings of um, tailing, five different tailings in different states, but here put the, the ligands back onto it. Then what we can start to see is that as these molecules, um, as these tailings unpack these switches, it's spatially organizing molecules in the Z dimension. And by Z, I mean, I'm calling X and Y the membrane, and this is coming down away from it as these switches unfold. And I've just stressed here that this is only three switches shown unfolding because then it goes off the page. Hello, Kai. So tailing is at a 15 degree angle relative to the membrane. Um, 
only in in, in a cell in a... under the under the um, under the nucleus. I don't think it's a fifteen degrees. Yeah, I think it is because the actin cytoskeleton is is cortical and it doesn't pull into the middle of the cell. It pulls uh, tangential to the to the membrane. So um, yeah, but not if you've got all of your um, attachments at one end of a like in a synapse or in a thing where it's at one end and then you pull it. Synapse, even, yes, even but in a focal mind, adhesion. In focal adhesion. I said synapse maybe, but focal adhesion. Um, it's always going to be very close to the membrane, even when it's extended. The the actin cytoskeleton, the cortical actin cytoskeleton, doesn't isn't further than a f, you know a hundred or so nanometers from the membranes. It's not pulling in normal to the membrane in, in a focal no, no, the angle of it's kind of important, but it, it is the same principle it stands. You're still going to position these along an angle. It doesn't matter Absolutely. which way that line is. Yes, but it's very course, close to the membrane. It's always going to be close to the membrane. I think that's the main point that I wanted to, if it's a focal adhesion, it's going to be basically normal, being extended um, along the membrane. Because that's the force uh, vector. It's not into the middle of the cell. Yeah, well, maybe we should chat offline because I think the yeah. interaction of the localization of where Kant goes around these and the lengths, how far it can reach, indicates that it's going further into the um into the cell than just a straight up 15 degrees because you physically localize these molecules to the edge of these adhesions as a function when it binds, when they get stretched out. So I don't think it's coming down at 90 degrees vertically up, but I also think that 15 degrees is only one fringe case of it. Mm. Okay. Um, and we actually, we have a, a, a question in the chat that seems um, potentially relevant to this discussion. It was from a few slides back when you first showed the um, the, the different dimensions of the pulled out talon. And so Aaron Cram, uh, it says, very cool. Um, does the molecule um, really extend like that when it's embedded in the actin cytoskeleton? So I think that's relevant to what you and yes, Claire were just sure. discussing. And I think the so I'll show an image of um, tailing in, in, in dendritic spines later on, but I think the best evidence for it is the, the work from Mike Sheets with the Felix Margadan um, cyclical stretching of tailing, where they could show tailing was stretching from 50 to 350 nanometers in cycles by measuring the end-to-end -end distance. Um, so that to me shows that between six and seven domains are opening up a tailing during that duration. And in a migrating cell, then that, um, that's limited because the lifetime of the linkages, because then they disassemble at a certain point, so they turn over. I'm actually not sure if that answers the question now. What was the question again? If it actually does that in the cortex. Right, when you have, <laughs> since you have the, you know, the actin cytoskeleton there, um, yeah. can they actually extend that far? Yeah, well, that's measured from, um, yeah, the end-to-end -end distance of tailing would indicate that they do stretch, maybe not to, um, to 350 nanometers easily, yeah. Great. We'll let you um, continue you. on and people can keep um, dropping questions yeah, please, in please the just, chat. I'm enjoying this. Um, I forgot where I am now. Um, okay. Oh, yeah. So these are proteins are spatially organized in Z. Whatever angle you've got of your um, tailing, they're still spatially organized along a force vector. And just to highlight, I'm not going to go through everything we've done, but just one example of an enzyme which is organized in this way. And that's the um, cyclin dependent kinase one. And this is some work done with Matt Jones and Martin Humphreys in, in Manchester and with help from Tom Sashachenko and then some single molecule work with Jan G's team. And CDK1 is a tailing ligand which actually sits on, on, C, on tailing on the R8 switch. But the interesting thing is it phosphorylates lots and lots of adhesion proteins. And I'm sure um, Claire may well put a hand up again in a second. Um, but it phosphorylates lots of things around this site. But it also phosphorylates, one of the substrates is actually a feedback mechanism where it phosphorylates onto tailing. So tailing physically positions CDK1 at specific layers within this cellular structure up until CDK1 phosphorylates tailing. And then you get this dramatic shift in the stability of the domains which CDK1 is bound to. And that's another um, opportunity to show a video to try and visualize this where CDK1 binds to a switch so it phosphorylates things in this vicinity, but by, um, by destabilizing that domain, 
it ultimately introduces over 100 nanometers extension into the angle, into the length of the molecule along whichever angle that's at. Um, and this, to me, it indicates not only can you write information into these in the form of signaling outputs, but you can also have, I don't know up in there, this possibility of kind of essentially a logic gate because here you've got, if you've got tension, then and an active kinase, you get this 110 nanometer extension. If you've just got tension, then the next weakest domain will unfold. Or if you've got an active kinase, but no tension, it can phosphorylate lots of adhesive substrates. So here's an example of an enzyme being specifically located at certain layers within a focal adhesion or within an adhesion structure as a function of these switch patterns. And what's not hard to imagine is that the, these molecules being spatially organized, we've just drawn a membrane bound one in orange and then a green and a pinky blue one, that it's almost like a Venn diagram. In some of these um, patterns, you bring these molecules really close together. And if you have an enzyme and a substrate and you physically hold them close together, then you can have high um, act activity. If you physically hold them far apart, then you can have low activity because they can't reach each other. And if they're freely diffusing, then you get the classic diffusing um, kinetics, which we all, we all kind of know and love. Um, and this, gen this idea of um, scaffold proteins coordinating um, enzymes isn't new. If anyone who's done a, cell, um, a cancer biology or a cell signaling third, um, undergraduate module will have talked about the MAP kinase pathway and the kinase suppressor of RAS, this um, predominantly unstructured protein which binds the, all of the kinases in the, in the MAP kinase cascade, bringing them together in space and time to control the flow of information. The big difference here is that tailing is not an inert molecule which is just flopping around to do that. Tail is mechanically operated so it can move these back and forwards relative to each other would be the idea. So the next question we we're interested in that these spheres on this figure were just drawn as 30 nanometer circles because they look nice and it's kind of aesthetically pleasing at that size. But what actually determines the size of those um, zones of activity and when and where these um, this Venn diagram will intersect. And what's this one? I've just put some slides back in, so I've gone out of order. Um, yeah. So then the next thing we realized was that this molecule is changing shape on these um, large scales. Things like CDK1, which bind via the kinase domain, they have a very small zone of activity because the, um, but most of the other proteins which bind to tailing tend to have this, this, um, this mode of binding where they have a, um, a binding site, a tailing binding site, which is separated from the rest of the molecule by a large unstructured region, this spaghetti, which you, everyone sees in alpha fold. And then the enzymatic domain is at the other end of this. And what that kind of does is it means that each of these, these enzymes, which have got a tether in this way, are tethered to a certain location in the cell. So this one is um, an enzyme we're working on at the minute. Um, this is bound to a domain, and then it's got its unstructured linker. And then that enzyme, um, enzymatic domain, is free to operate anywhere within this sphere. And this is exactly the same as this goat in a field where he's tethered, is tethered by this string and this stake. And he'll eat a really tight circle of grass, the entire the length of that rope um, around that center point of the stake. If you make the rope longer, it'll eat a longer patch of grass. And if you move the stake, it will be, it'll eat a different patch of grass. And this is what's happening here. This enzyme can move, is operating here. If you move these closer, it could then reach the membrane and work on membrane um, substrates. But here it's not going to reach the membrane. So we started to get this idea that maybe these tethered enzymes have got discrete zones of activity, which can be moved by moving the tether point. So we went back to alpha fold, we went back to our structural modeling, and we went back to measuring the distance between um, these tether points and the enzymatic domain. And that enabled us to draw these zones of activity, the same as here, but for all the other different proteins which are binding into tailing. And then we got to raise this question of what this would look like in, inside a cell. And obviously, as Claire's pointing out, the cell um, is, um, in culture or so it's very noisy it's very there's a lot of contributions there's a lot of inputs um, if you really want to have mechanical computation to happen on a um with high fidelity what you need is you need to detach the mechanical computation into an isolated mechanical unit 
distal from the cell body. And that's exactly what I think a dendritic spine or a synapse is. You've got this um, branch and then you've got this um, headlight region. So we, did, we chose to focus on the synaptic adhesions just because they're a much simpler system and a much simpler geometry. And if you look at the dimensions of these, these tend to be about one micron in, um, by one micron. So now if we go and draw these to scale on the same way that we've drawn tail in to scale, then what we can see is that tailing um, is shown in the fully O state and then the fully one state here, fully closed and fully open. You can see that tailing easily spans the length of these um, spines, these um, mechanical units. Um, and here I've drawn on, we, we modeled on all 11 vinculins to show um, where they will dock onto this. So what you can immediately see without, um, is that this tailing as it, open, if it, as it opens and extends out, it spatially, it layers across this um, unit with these binding sites positioned at fixed um, locations away from the interim attachment sites, which have been reported to be around the edge of the postsynaptic density. And now we can take the, the zones of activity, which I, I mentioned on the previous slide, all drawn to the, exactly the same scale, and we can start to lay these onto this. And what you can immediately see is depending on the switch patterns, you spatially organize these molecules in, in Z coming away from um, the top of this thing, um, of this spine. Um, so the moving, as you open these switches, you spatially organize these and separate them out and resolve them in Z. And as these patterns change, you could update and reposition and reorganize these molecules. That's the general idea. And this is something we're desperately trying to prove because I think that if this is true, then this um, would really um, explain a lot and it would point to um, this binary coding running a lot of neuronal activity. And what you can see measuring the length of tailing is that they are much longer than um, at rest. They're more, they're, they're stretching to three, 400 nanometers. So coming a, a sizable distance down each of these um, spines all in one direction. But this led to this idea and this thinking about this, that you could kind of imagine that within any, within a spine, but also within any cell, you've got, you could imagine that all of the molecules could be separated into three um, sort, sort of um, types, two ordered and one disordered. You've got things which are physically attached to membranes or to organelles, which are static relatively. And then you've got things which are freely diffusing. Um, and then you've got another ordered component, which is being physically moved by these switches opening and closing, recruiting to specific locations in, in, in Z. So then you can have, imagine that you could have a scenario where you have a static component and then you move the other layer up and down relative to it by switching on the motor proteins and switching on contractility and reorganizing these um, synaptic scaffolds, which don't have to just include tailing. There's other protein, other synaptic scaffolds are available, but tailing is the only one which has got these 13 binary switches in, in order. But then you can start to imagine that you could look at a dendrite, which has got 100 or 1,000 um, spines on it, and each of those spines has got a um, different activity. And if you look with a microscope, they all look exactly the same. But here you could imagine that by spatially organizing these enzymes relative to each other, then some of these um, combinations might give rise to high activity where all the enzymes are lined up. So you go, duh, 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 duh. And some, they might be held apart, which means that they'd have suppressed activity. And this would be an idea we'd think about where a signal coming through the synapse, switching on the motor proteins, would pull specifically on the one it was stimulated because that's where the motor proteins are switched on. And that's not, that's, that's shown, that's experimentally shown by others. But here that switching on of the motors would pull on these scaffolds and update these patterns. So the analogy which we use, which is really nice over this side of the pond, but isn't good for um, all the ones in America, because you tend to have um, automatic transmission. But in, in my car, um, we've got a manual gear stick and the, reason, the way that a gear stick works is it moves a mechanically operated part of the machinery relative to a static part of the machinery. And in doing so, it changes the transmission through that um, gearbox. And that's kind of what I'm, when I'm trying to, I'm, we're trying to test is happening here, where you're changing the transmission by organizing these um, components relative to each other. And then you'd update this by physically um, sending signals, which would then change the weight and change the activity of each of these spines independently. 
And if you could get on board with that, that you could imagine a mechanical way to dial up or down the activity of a, a synapse, then by writing information into it, then you could imagine that you could write huge amounts of information in, in binary format in exactly the same way. You send a signal, you switch on the motor proteins and you update the register of these switches, which then changes the flow of electricity around that circuit. And if you look at what the cortex looks like, it looks perfectly built for such um, operations because it's incredibly logical and it's incredibly repetitive, comprised of two million of these cortical columns, which are just a network of um, neurons. And these teardrops, these little red teardrops, pyramidal cells, they can have up to 60,000 different synapses where they're intricately wired to all of the other neurons in this um, layer. And then they have trunk wiring back to the um, hippocampus and the memory control center. And what's interesting to me is that this is an arrangement of synapses. If you could imagine you could dial these all up or down as a function of signals, you could physically write information into them. And what's striking to me was if you look at um, what, as we've tried to um, develop and optimize data storage in silico, so we now got terabyte disks, which will fit on the end of your fingernail. The way that we do that is to have many, many identical repeating channels, each repetitive, they're all exactly the same, but each one given a specific address. So you can write specifically to that site. And then you call it back by the flow of electricity back through upon calling it. And I think that this indicates a way to write information. And just to finish up, um, this leads to this idea that um, everything we do, everything we see, listening to this, but everything from the minute we're born, sends these, triggers the sensory neurons and send action potentials into this calculation. And it would just tune the weights of all of these synapses by just pushing and pulling on these switches which may or may not be true, but I think it's extrapolated based on this core principle of these memory molecules, which are being controlled via um, signals switching on contractility. And I like to think, and I like to argue, and this is philosophy, probably mathematical philosophy, if that's a thing, that you could write um, every, from a minute that the brain's developed in, in utero, it could start to be written with um, information based on the uniqueness of that animal's life. So it optimizes that individual for um, its own circumstances. So just to finish and to ground it back, and I'm, um, if I've got one more minute after as much as one thing quickly, um, this is quite wacky, but it's also based on experimental data. We can physically show that tailings a memory molecule. We can physically write information into it using small changes of force, and we can read it out by looking what's bound to it. And it's present in every single cell, pretty much, in our body. And if all of our cells are mechanically synchronized, you could kind of imagine that this is a machine code. All of the cells have got um, switches all over them. Every single organelle, the nucleus, the cell, they've all got binary switches. So you could start to imagine that this is a, a binary, we're binary creatures, is what I'd like to put out there. But just going into the brain, I'd just like to say that I, I reckon that this is the physical location of data storage in animals. You write information into the shapes of the molecules in such a way that you control the flow of electricity. And that sounds wacky, but to me, what I like most about that as an idea is it's completely consistent with all that's known about electrochemical signaling, where the circuits and the electricity goes round. But the difference here would be that the actual information processing and storage would be happening on the mechanical layer under the hood. And it'd be read out by looking at these changes in electrochemical signaling. And because um, uh, everything's getting converted into a binary format, I think that that indicates the read-write memory system. So I look forward to getting shot down on that. But I think that's basically an extrapolation of what we're physically seeing on these individual memory molecules. And I think that that enables for classical computational information processing systems um, and some sort of mechanical supercomputer. So I'm gonna finish there, but if I'm allowed two more minutes, I'll just show something afterwards. But I really want to thank a, third, a few people, in particular, um, Yan Ji in Singapore. This has been brilliant ever since that first experiment, that first email, every single experiment which we've done since has just opened up this whole new way of looking at things and everything. So it's it's really exciting and it's an ongoing and the stuff we're doing at the minute is just, yeah, it's brilliant. Um, Sam for making these videos, which have been so helpful for showing this. Um, Martin Schwartz and Nick Brown have been constantly challenging me and telling me 
pulling on the reins a little bit, which has been very helpful. Um, the guys in the lab and everyone else who's collaborated to this. And I just want to finish with this. I did have it in the talk, but I wanted to just flag it here because it came out in this month's um, Journal of Cell Biology. But just to indicate that we, we, um, we've discovered that there's an extra exon in the tailing one gene, which has been missed for the last 40 years. And it's really important because it changes the switch pattern which form because it destabilizes two of the switches at the start of the tailing rod. And just as a um, for everyone who's working on tailing one, and I assume there's lots of us, it's essential, I think, to check which version of tailing one your cell type is using because they behave completely differently and respond to drugs completely differently depending which version of tailing they are using. And if you work on pancreatic or skin cells, then tailing is exclusively the long form with this new exon in it. Um, so that's just as um, an FYI, I suppose. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you so much, Ben. Fantastic. That was amazing. I'm, I'm going to digest the fact that I'm a binary creature. <laughs> okay, so we have a question from Prabhu. Uh, is asking from the initial part of your talk, does the force get transmitted throughout the domains equally? And does this depend on how much the domain would open up in the direction of the force or the time scale of observation or the extension rate? Oh, sorry. Um, so they open, they do get transmitted through equally. Um, and you would predict that the ones at the end would unfold first, but the ones at the very at the start are very um, stable. R3 unfolds first. But then the other complication, what we're currently trying to do with G is the, the, what we've worked out here is the switch patterns we've formed with pure end-to-end -end pulling, which is really important. But then that also gets, when a vinculin binds, it provides the, the next pull is pulling against where that vinculin is. So the order will change as a function of that. So the complexity of this and which switch patterns you end up with is a work in progress. Um, and I don't know if that answered the question, but one of the things we're really keen to do is to measure that, see what states these are in. And we're developing probes now to actually read the shape of these molecules <coughs> so we can see what we've um, got. Okay, fantastic. So we'll just um, go through these, um, uh, what's in the chat. And also, as usual, if people want to um, raise their hands and ask their questions themselves, I'll encourage them to do so. Um, so we have another question from Aaron Cram asking if stretching re uh, reveals enzymatic cleavage sites. Um, there are reports of that, yes. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me at all if that's the case. And um, there's a report of a calpain cleavage site in the R10 switch. I'd, I've not seen if that was followed up on, but yeah, it would definitely indicate that you could expose binding. You would expect it because if you imagine you expect 60 to, if you stretch it 600 nanometers, say, there's a lot of um, hydrophobic stuff there. There's a lot of conserved regions. There's probably a lot of linear binding sites. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if there's um, cryptic cleavage sites. There's a lot of cryptic phosphorylation sites. And one of the things which I find most in, um, intriguing is if we look at the brain phosphoproteomics or the heart phosphoproteomics, there's phosphorylation of serines and threonines, which normally reside inside the hydrophobic core of these domains. So these domains are mechanosensitive because they've got serines and threonines inside them, which enables them to always refold back to the same state. If you phosphorylate one of those, it will stay locked in the in the open one state. So these state these patterns can be made more persistent by enzymatic um, reactions, chemical changes, phosphorylating them. If, if I'm next in the, I think I'm next in the chat. Um, yeah, go order. for it. Sorry, I was waiting for Ankita, but I think we lost her. So Claire, please okay. go ahead. Okay, so I said I agree with your drawing in the spine of of how t um, tailin is going to stretch along the axis of the spine, because in that case, the actin retrograde flow is going from the spine tip to the base, but it's going to yeah. be along the membrane. But it is, I mean, in that dimension, it's going to um, it's going to stretch half the length of a spine, just like you show. So I totally agree with that. Um, okay. But I'm thinking about your the idea of binaryism. When you have um, an ensemble of thousands of molecules that are all in different states of, I mean, if you frap tailin 
in a mature focal adhesion with shitloads of force on it, it's still binding and dissociating on the order yeah. of seconds, right? So anyone tailing in there is going to be going in there, getting stretched yeah. to some amount, and then dissociating from the integrin and, and the focal adhesion and coming back. So it's like well, this drawing where everybody is a distance from the membrane. Do you really think that ever happens? I don't, I don't think no, that would ever happen no, because I it's going to be, I think what you're going to get is like, I think just like with a computer, when you take a, a, the, the higher order sum of lots of binary stuff, you get emergent properties. And I think it's going to give rise to emergent properties that we could never predict because you have all of these different tailings in all of these different st- states of stretch. Um, yeah, that's going to give some information that you would never yeah. imagine from a single tailing. No, sure. So one of the things on that is originally a big challenge to the idea was that if you ever explicitly depend on every bit of, of a domain of a tailing, then if that tailing pings off and gets turned over, then you corrupt that information. So a much more um, logical part, and what I tried to show in that machinery moving up and down, is it's the whole machinery which is moving. So um, it's it's, well, it's the whole machinery of each tailing. It's yeah, not each all tailing, the tailings, each tailings in sync. Of, yes. Each tailing is part of a, a machinery which is moving this stuff. And the idea for the whole thing came from this idea that you've got um, gaps and gaps for contractility on the tailing switches. So that even though you might have them in different states, you're going to have a certain amount of contract. There'll be a, I think there's a solution to that where the positive and negative regulators of contractility even out so that across the the whole focal adhesion say no we're not focused there might be an average because they're so dynamic that they they they've tricked everyone into thinking that these are incredibly amorphous structures whereas i think there's a higher ordering in these in in tissues um but even in there where they're migrating there's a there's an ensemble average where um all of these interdependencies might balance out to give rise to the net effect yes i agree but i don't i don't know that we can we're not a, I mean, I love the thinking, Ben. I love it. I thought it was a lovely, lovely talk. And it, um, but it's, it's like chat GPT. We don't ever know what it's going to spit out. You know what I mean? The, the result of all of those tailings in all of those different states. Yes. It, it's going to spit out something that we might not, we wouldn't predict, even if we understand the molecule very well, because it's, emer- it's emergent. It's going to have emergent, emergent properties. It might also be because of interdependencies that there might be discrete states within that which are stable. Uh, that's the idea I would say. And I'd say that there's probably not 10,000 activation states of a synapse. Looking in the literature, it looks like there's probably more like 20 to 30, depending yeah, on yeah. the ability. And their end states of um, a calculation moving this machinery would be what I would argue, but um, not everyone I'm sure would agree with that, but that would be the idea. Yeah, anyway, it was really beautiful. Thank you so much for stimulating my brain. <laughs> Thank you, Claire. Thank, thanks for that great discussion, y'all. Um, I'm gonna ask a question that we have from one of our um, YouTube viewers. They're asking, um, do you have any idea of the force range that's applied to tailing physiologically and how this correlates to actin applied forces? And is this required um, actin based stress? Um, does it require, sorry, does it require actin based stress fibers or do you think branched actin would be sufficient? Um, so the forces use, there's been multiple groups use tension sensors on, um, on tailing and on related molecules. And what you normally see is that the tension remains fairly low with in t- transient increases in tension, and then it drops, and then you get um, a low contractility. So there, um, a low tension again. And the idea would be that that increase in contractility happens until you cause an unfolding event, and then that introduces slack into the system, and that then reduces the tension. So then it would be that the motors or the... Um, I think the retrograde flow can activate R3 for sure, because we could activate that just with flow in our chamber when we're trying to measure vinculin binding, if we, if we drew it across too hard, the flow would activate it. So I think there's all of them as possible. And I think um, cortical actin, sure, I'm sure if it's pulling and um, exerting tension in the right way, I think, yeah, I think it could definitely. And I don't think it needs okay, huge fantastic. test fibers to trigger this. Okay. Great, I think that's the crux of the question. Um, from Ajay, um, are mutations in tailing associated with learning or neural defects? 
Um, yeah, so I don't want to say too much about that, but yes, they are. And we've got a class of, um, a new class of um, childhood early onset epilepsy, which is caused by mutations in the, in the pulling part of the tailing molecule. So the idea there we're trying to develop is that that is a result of the mispositioning of these enzymes as a function of, um, because they're supposed to be pulled to here, but they're only here and they get out of sync and then you get a re-entry circuit. So I think that yes, they are mutations in tailing one for sure. So I, I just add, I guess to that, it was a really, really fantastic talk and a very creative idea that you presented to us. Uh, so, I mean, the, the fascinating sort of uh, prediction from the model you've predict, uh, shown is that uh, mutations in different parts of the tail end would possibly give rise to very distinct sort of uh, categories of problems. And that if you did a comparison of uh, mutations in, in different parts, that there would be kind of yes. almost different syndromes associated with uh no I, I i i appreciate the rec I, I, yeah as an idea that sounds good but the problem is that tailings at work in every single cell type so mutations there's not many mutations in 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 the two tailing genes which are viable more um, than not more often than not they're not but something which i think is interesting on that is that integrins there's 24 integrins and if you get a mutation in an integrin you get a very specific disease like if it's involved in in clotting or it's involved in the immune system one of the, we have got a mutation in tailing which came from a patient um which was ever so subtle it caused a tiny like five percent change in integrin activation but because it affected the integrin activation it affected every single um integrin activation so he that guy that um he's got the most broad spectrum like every single he's got lots of things and um, lots of ailments um, which indicated all of the things where tailings is essential to me. Um, um, but it basically it had all the, it, it was like basically having mutations in all of your integrins because every single one of them was slightly defective. Um, but there's not many mutations yet discovered in tailing, in tailings. Right. Great. But, Amazing. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, Ajay, since you're here, do you want to just ask your second question as well? Oh, no, I think it was just a comment. I just liked uh, Claire's uh, idea about the emergent, that, it's, that she would expect emergent properties based on the uh, collective state of all the different, uh, it was, I thought that was a cool idea. Yes. And the okay, time scale. Great. Then, yeah, the time scale question. Do you no, see I that mean, then? Yeah, oh, that's that. right. I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being nosy and looking ahead. Um, uh, yeah, I think the time scale. I think this, the, the, as soon as attention is sufficient, a domain unfolds instantaneously. Um, but the, with all of these cell signaling pathways, and like with um, growth factor signaling, you get immediate effects and then longer term effects. Once you set the ball in motion of a cell signaling cascade, the timing becomes sort of secondary because as long as you activate that receptor, which activates that gap, which then activates that whatever and gets contractility switched on then you triggered that and then it can pull and change that for future. So the timings have all to be worked out. Actually, my, my question was more related to the idea that people have studied the dynamics of spine morphology and uh, whether in the studies that have concentrated on that, not necessarily how it's linked to the mechanism you uh, described, whether it's known whether these changes are linked to short-term changes in memory or long-term changes in memory. So it's a more sort of a neuroscience -y question, but I don't yes. know that you know. The big that. challenge with all of, all of the neuroscience stuff is because these are perfect seal mechanical units, the yeah. second we detach them and look at them outside, the mechanics, the perfection's gone. They start to just fizzle out and melt right. away. It's really hard to visualize spines because they don't want to exist until they're in that perfect seal mechanical unit. Um, but we're trying to collaborate with neuroscientists to look at some of that stuff and to actually link this from a nice idea to a, um, a neuro neurological function. Great. I loved it. I'm going to <laughs> recommend you to the neuroscience series at the NIH. Oh, amazing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Awesome. Um, all right. So uh, I can, we're definitely going to go past the hour. Are you okay, Ben, to stay on yeah, and keep I'm answering questions? Sure. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I've great. Do um, 20 minutes. And uh, I guess uh, you you owe Dave a um, I don't know yeah. a coffee or something I, for I spiked getting his sick. coffee last night. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Our next question is from uh, Mehmet Sen. I'm wondering if you've observed refolding of tail and domains after stretching, for instance, in molecular tweezers, and if so, molecular tweezer experiments, if so, have you observed refolding in cells? Um, yeah, so they definitely refold with high fidelity because all those images I showed were six or 12 cycles. You can pull and open and close them all day long on their own. Interestingly, if you add the vinculin and particularly constitutively active vinculin, then you can open it. But if constitutively active vinculin binds, it never lets go. So then it will never um, refold. Um, and we can measure that. And then that enables you to show with um, wild type vinculin that's not what happens. It, bind, it binds, limits refolding for a period of time, but then it can come off because it will auto inhibit itself. So the dynamics of refolding is something we're very interesting and is very quantifiable and um, for actually measuring um, force dependent binding constants. You can see how quick it takes for these things to refold or to be displaced. Um, Great, and fantastic. Cells, yeah, the, the fact that the cycles of um, elongation and stretching and contraction seem in contracting cells by um, Mike Sheets's um, study, I think that indicates that these are folding and refolding. Okay, awesome. Um, our next question is from Bob Fisher, um, asking about, um, aren't there different domains? It doesn't each different domain have a different spring constant and then wouldn't the unfolding order just sort of be dependent on those different spring constants? Um, yeah, they do. They, I mean, like we, as, as when Claire asked me a question at the start, like they, they, we could categorize them into different ones where really weak ones, quite, quite mechanically amenable, pretty strong. And then the ones which are like really, really solid and probably unlikely to unfold. And that could be distilled out as a spring constant because that's the force threshold at which it would open up. And the order is dependent on that. Yes. The complication there is that with three of them, which have got very similar spring constants, you can't say for certain which of those three will go. Certainly not with the resolution we can, we've got in our, in our systems. And it, that's in the absence of all the other factors. So, yes, I think. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, I think... Um... I think it's a very natural question, right? When we see this opening, is just wondering how how um, how consistent it is. Um, so that makes a lot of sense. So from Hani Suleiman um, says, "Nice talk. Experimentally, is there any evidence to differences in the tail and length um, as the dendritic spine matures from philopodia to the mushroom-like shape?" Um, not we're, that's something we're actively working on at the minute. No, we don't see. We see differences between different spines, different lengths, but they're presumably mature. We, um, it's still very much a work in progress. So you'd envisage it probably would, and you'd envisage that when two neurons touch each other, that as they mechanically mm -hmm. synchronize, then you'd end up with specific patterns on both sides of that um, linkage would be the idea. Ben, can you just help um, me understand? So I'm used to thinking about, you know, sort of crawling mesenchymal or epithelial cells when you think of a lot of force being exerted, you know, through integrin mediated focal adhesions yes. and everything. Um, but for neurons, I mean, how mechanically active are these um, synapses? Uh, is there any sense, you know, because I guess I'm realizing I don't have a great physical understanding yes. compared to crawling yes. cells. So crawling cell, obviously, you need to generate huge amounts of force, and huge amount of traction force to physically move a whole cell from here to here. In a thing which is in a sealed unit, and you've only got to switch on contractility to, to cause um, shape changes in proteins which are um, already wired up, I think the forces can be much lower. I think there's a huge amount of, um, in a, a bit of a follow-on to AJ's question, but there's a, a vast number of diseases, neuro and learning difficulties and other things associated with dysregulation of contractility in, in neurons. Mm. Um, so if I think the forces are much lower. And for a long time, I was always told that mechanical transduction probably doesn't happen in the brain because it's so soft. But then I actually think that's the strength because then you can make a mechanically isolated thing. And then the only forces you need is sufficient to cause a transition of a protein domain, which is a much, I'd imagine is much, much smaller force required than to pull a whole cell from here to here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating to think about. And also just what's going on in development mechanically versus, you know, adult just learning and 
and absolutely you know, as we it's just really sit fun. here with our with our squishy brains um yeah. sorry <laughs> next question from um olivier perts um do you have a rough idea which different proteins bind to specific tail and mechanical states and which would then uh which morphogenetic programs they would induce um, so the lists ever growing, most of the interesting ones, which we haven't published yet, I didn't put on that list, um, but we've got multiple enzymes which are decorating this um, and morphogenic. Thing. So trying to take it back to like the classic work of Dennis Disher and these things of these stem cells differentiating as a function of stiffness. That to me, I, if I, that was in my, I don't know where that went. I normally have that in my slide deck. I think that's a beautiful study. But by physically changing the stiffness, that changes the mechanical states in the tailing, would be what I would argue. And then you get the global mechanotransduction downstream of that. I would say the tailing's sitting at the top of all of this mechanotransduction. Awesome. Um, um, great. Yeah. Ankita, welcome back. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next question is from Artem asking, uh, can a protein be an intermediate state between folded and unfolded for saving information? Um, so another thing which I've drawn here, which uh, there may be a question lower down, is that I've drawn all these things fully extended um, because that's the maximum length. Obviously, if it's not under tight, if, it's, if you hold it really tight, it will be like that, like a tug of war rape. If I, we pull really hard, it'll be fully straight. But if we don't pull really hard, it'll probably bow in the middle. So it will be shorter than that maximum length. If these things have got something sitting on them or they've got a phosphorylation on them, it could come quite close, but it would still not be able to refold because it, it couldn't refold because it's got something bound or it's got a modification which prevents it. In which case you could have it a much shorter length, like it could just move in and out. Um, so whether there's intermediate states the good thing is here, I think you could say with quite high certainty that there might be different states once it's open, but it's either folded or it's unfolded. So I think there's two states at that level. Uh, okay, thank you for detail um, answer. Uh, I started to think that one of the first computers that were developed, they use not binary systems, they use a, a triple system. I mean that each has three states, for instance, minus one, zero, and one. And due to this reason, I ask this question, maybe in biology also, it can be used not binary system, but some another system for saving information. Yeah, um, I, of course. I think in terms of the actual tailing and the switches, I, I think that they're two states, but then there's 13 of them. What we don't talk about here is the direct connections to the nucleus and the mechanotransduction, which comes from synchronizing these different systems together. So you know, you could easily have different um, higher order states, um, which are, uh, yeah. So I don't know, it's a very short answer, but yeah, interesting idea. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for uh, answer. Um, I think next question was from Tanner, if you're around. Wanted to ask the question. Ah, perfect. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Ben, for the talk. So my question is, uh, if how does the mutations in talent bring about uh, aberrant cellular fate specification at the time of neurogenesis? So I say it again. So how do different talin states? Uh, no. If there's a mutation talin. Uh, yeah. In tail and protein, do you think that there would be aberrant cell fate specification during neurogenesis? Um, yes, definitely. I think if you've got no tailing, then you don't even get past embryonic day eight. If you have got tailing, it will be mutations in the fact that there's very few which make it to um, birth. You probably lose a lot of them by failure at specific morphogenic stages, which don't complete, and then it doesn't continue. The few which get through, um, which give rise to these neurogenic neurological diseases, I guess there's with two tailing, there's a bit of redundancy in the system until you need to be fully quantitative because you've got two copies of tailing one and two copies of tailing two. So a lot of the broad stroke stuff you could probably compensate, but then specific things which need to be quantitative, then the exact number of them and the exact number of switches and the exact probably comes into play. But it's all to be worked out. Um, Anna. Thanks. Thank I think we have a last question from Anna. Uh, says, beautiful talk. 
Um, and she's curious about what happens to tail in unfolding if FAC is not there because uh, the binding is important between them. Um, so if FAC's not there in a fruit fly, then um, I don't think anything happens. But if, flat, if FAC's not there in a, in a mammalian cell, then um, yeah, I guess you get defects in some of these processes. Um, yeah, I, hi. Hey, How Anna. are you? And good to see you. Nice to yeah, see you. one of my <laughs> questions is um, if you're looking at the binding of FAC. So you present a CDK1, but FAC, I think, is a main actor in during yes. attention maturation. And then it's very important for elongation. And that correlates yeah. a little bit with the uh, unfolding of uh, tailing. So I was wondering if yeah. you see changes in this unfolding of tailing when FAC is recruited, since we know that that's all this mechanochemical transduction of phosphorylation of many other proteins. Yes. Um, so I think that, yeah, you're right that fact's really important in this. And I think um, tyrosine phosphorylation at the early stage of this is really, really important. I think that the interaction between FAC and tailin is complicated. I'm not quite sure how, how that occurs yet. Some of the things we've tried, um, we don't see the same as what's been um, reported, but if you've got a lead on the fact tailing, someone's giving you nice bunny ears as well, which is... <laughs> That's Bob. <laughs> um, if, um, yeah, I mean, if you've got a lead for how fact binds to tailing, which we can re we can do ourselves, I'd love to test that, because that would be interesting, and that's what we're trying to get back at now. So you will point that probably fact is recruited by vinculin? Uh, Possibly, and then it will be uh, exerting more or less same type of changes because when these bind together, also they make a lot of changes in recruitment of other proteins, right? Yeah. No, I mean, I, I totally do, I agree. It's just I can't. We can't. We don't always see. Well, we don't really see fact binding yeah. tail biochemically, so that limits. Because okay. it'd be good to do that in the single molecule level and see what's going going on. So the yeah. Interaction. Maybe we should yeah. chat blind on that because I'd love to know if you've got any ways to get at that. Yeah, I, I think we we have to also wrap <laughs> up because <you. laughs> Waterman Lab has to go for <laughs> journal club now. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Ben. I think we we are done with the questions. I'm not missing anybody's. Um, yeah, thank you so we're all so set much. on yeah. YouTube, so we're good. Awesome, thank you so much. And Sorry, go ahead. A lot okay. fun. I, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, we we could only tell you last minute about days <laughs> it worked because... out really well so i'm glad <laughs> i hope dave recovers quickly and it's just a 24-hour clear out thing yeah but... <laughs> i hope so too yeah okay thank you so much ben we'll see you around